Paul Collier is indeed uh, one of the leading thinkers on matters of the political, economic, and developmental predicaments of poor countries. And he is a professor of economics and public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government, as well as director of the Center for the Study of African Economies, both at Oxford University. And as many of you know, he, of course, also advises uh, many, many development agencies, the World Bank and governments. Um, we talked a little bit earlier. He, he literally stepped off a plane uh, uh, from China, where he was with an official delegation, uh, discussing the implications of the most recent decisions in the Central Committee on, on as, as I'm sure you're all aware of, on how they change their, their next five-year plan. Um, and we are, of course, even more delighted to have Paul Collier, a visiting professor at the School of Public Policy here at CU, where he will to teach um, as of next academic year. Uh, his last visit, we just talked about that, uh, to the School of Public Policy was at par as part of our executive education programs that focused on the natural resource course, and he would come again um, teaching in this executive education course. I believe it is in next March. Paul Collier is a prolific author, and in his writings he has consistently and courageously addressed some of the most complex issues uh, in the global political economy, in the world of development. He has written extensively on globalization, governance in low-income countries, economic growth, of course the resource curse, and the economics of civil war and poverty. And his most recent book is no exception to that. Um, it was just published about a month ago. Exodus, as the title is, takes on one of the most complex and controversial issues of public policy in the 21st century, namely immigration and multiculturalism in the 21st century. And as some of you know, this book is inspired by a personal life story. And the book argues that when it comes to migration, policymakers have been asking the wrong questions up to now. Now, this lecture today is the first in a series of lectures. Uh, Paul will give a total of three lectures here at the School of Public Policy this academic year, all of which evolve around the topic of migration. And the questions that Paul Collier will address today are First, whether migration is just an inevitable facet of globalization. What are the main drivers um, of migration? And what are the implications for future migration? Should there be a right to migrate? And importantly, which effects of migration should matter for public policy? Our moderator for this evening's event is SPP faculty member Christina cordunano huch Christina herself is an expert on the political economy of development. She's also currently a Max Weber Fellow at the European Union Institute in Florence. And in addition to that, she consults with the World Bank at the World Bank Institute on a range of developmental issues. So without further ado notice, Paul, thank you so much for making the way all the way from China, or a little detour, I should say. And the floor is yours, and I look very much forward to an engaged and exciting discussion. Well, thanks very much uh, for inviting me. It's nice to be back. Um, uh, usually, when a speaker you know, drones on, there's a danger that he puts the audience to sleep. In this case, there's a real danger that the speaker falls asleep. <laughs> Um, in which case, try and wake me up. Right? Um, uh, let, let, me, let me start with um, straight into the topic. Um, and I should say that the, these three lectures are just going to focus on migration, because um, when I come back and start teaching a course, I want to teach a course on economic development. And so I want to now talk about something which is different from the I'll be giving. Right? So rather than just do you a, a quick version of what I'm going to say in more, more depth through a course, I'm going to talk about something that, that's distinct from the course I'll be giving. And it seems sensible to talk about my new book. Um, so is migration inevitable part of globalization? Let's start with that question. Um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of rather loose thinking about this, which, which kind of sees the future 
as one in which everything is sort of globalized in the sense of everybody lives everywhere. Um, and I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's right. Um, first of all, migration isn't just an inevitable part of globalization, um, because if we look at the figures, um, if we look at migration within the OECD, that's migration within the rich world, um, over the last 60 years, it's basically stayed constant in absolute numbers. So as a proportion of the population, it's actually fallen. Meanwhile, international trade within the OECD has exploded. And capital movements within the OECD have exploded. So migration is not actually all part and a parcel of globalization. On the contrary, um, basically within the OECD, um, we, move, we move goods rather than people. We've got better at moving goods, and it's become less necessary to move people. Um, but migration has increased enormously over the last 60 years, but it's one particular category of migration. Um, it's not uh, migration within developing countries either, between developing countries, just as it's not migration within the rich countries, it's migration from poor to rich. That's the migration which has increased a lot. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and what the key driver of that migration is, of course, the gap in income. And the gap in income is itself a temporary phenomenon. Temporary not in the time frame of next year, there won't be one, right? um, but temporary in a much grander scale of time. Now, if we go back to about 1800, the income gap between the now developed world and the still poor world was much narrower. And if we look forward to, let's say, the year 2100, right, which you may live to see, I won't. Right? Mm -hmm. But let me predict that in the year 2100, the income gap between the rich world and the poor world will have narrowed decisively. Right? By the year 2200, it'll gone. Right? I've just come back from China, and I tell you, um, I'll tell you two things. One is I saw the future. Um, uh, and the other, um, going around Beijing, I saw fewer poor people than going around Budapest. Um, that's not to say if I, you, know, you range around in China, you'll find more poor people than you will in Hungary, of course. But, but the, the eastern part of China is now just, it's just, just already spectacularly successful, catching up with the developed world at, a, at an amazing rate. So if we look at the world in 2100, um, that income gap will have gone or be going, um, and the big driver of migration will be gone. And so if we look at uh, Ghana in 2100, um, it, Ghana in 2100 won't be people by a, just a, a random assortment of the world's population. It'll be people by Ghanaians. Yeah? It'll still be recognizably Ghanaian, and so on and so forth. So we are in a, a, a temporary phase, but it's a, it's a temporary phase that's going to last for the decades, not just a few years. But it's not a phase that's a permanent feature of globalization. In 2100, trade between countries will be massively greater than now. The migration will actually be less. Um, 
so if the income gap is fundamentally what's driving migration, um, what is determining the income gap? Because um, any, any analysis of migration um, must consider something about why there's that income gap. So I'm going to give you a very quick account of, of why I think there's an income gap. Uh, and in part, that's a history of, of the evolution of development economics. Um, when I was your age, I sat in a classroom like this, and the lecturer told me why rich countries were rich and poor countries were poor. Right? And what the lecturer said was, it's because the rich countries have a lot of capital and the poor countries don't. Right? You laugh, quite rightly. Right? Um, what's just come into my head is, uh, is the early Greek thinking about what supported the world, the Earth. And, uh, and the theory was that the, the Earth rests on a turtle. It wasn't a terribly good theory of the world, but that was it. The, the Earth rests on a turtle. And then after about 50 years, some smart Greek, they were awfully smart, those Greeks, some smart Greek thought to ask, and what does the turtle rest on? And the answer turned out to be, it's turtled all the way down, right? <laughs> but um, but, it's, but that we have the same evolution of economic thinking, but after a while, some smart student in the audience, as it were, not me, thought to pose the question to the lecturer, um, why have the rich countries got all the capital? After all, capital can move. Right? And so it couldn't be, the, the, the final answer to why are the rich countries rich couldn't be they've got a lot of capital. Right? Something it had to explain why they've got a lot of capital and the poor countries didn't. In other words, capital was endogenous in the, the language of, of social science. Um, so that was to the 1980s, and then in the 1980s, the answer was, oh, um, the rich countries are rich because they've got better economic policies than the poor countries. So that lasted until around the millennium. And then by the millennium, some smart kid in the audience, as it were, thought to ask, so why have they got better policies? Right? What does that turtle rest on? Right? Um, and the current answer, so we're now getting right up to date, 2013, the most fashionable answer, why have the, the rich countries got better policies? Because they've got better institutions. Right? That's the Asimoglu and Robinson. Right? So that's where we got to. That's the turtle that we've now arrived at. Right? And as, it, as far as it goes, I think that's a, a sensible answer. Uh, I don't think it goes far enough. Right? I think it's part of the answer. Um, uh, of course, the, 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 there's another turtle. Why do, why, do, why do they have good institutions? And the answer that Asimoglu and Robinson give is about the structure of political power. Yeah, it's a perfectly, perfectly sensible answer to that question, that the structure of institutions reflects the structure of political power. Um, and I think that's indeed part of the explanation of why rich countries are rich. Um, incidentally, we should always realize that rich countries didn't used to be rich. We're looking at a really relatively recent phenomenon. There have been, there have been societies for thousands of years, and they've all been poor. And then about 200 years ago, one, Britain, managed to break out of that, the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that spread to a few other countries. But we, I, it's important that you keep that in the back of your mind, because um, that was a phenomenally rare event. There have been hundreds and hundreds of societies all around the world, different societies, all poor. 
and then one breaks out once, then it's so we're looking at we're looking at a very rare event. Okay? I mean, the, the Asimoglu Robinson account is essentially that there was a political a shift in political power in Britain in 1688, which then basically moved power from uh, from the king to Parliament and started a process uh, which wasn't intended to produce income growth, but did. Um, well, I think that's part of the reason why rich countries are rich and poor countries are poor. I think there's much more to it than that. Um, and let me uh, let me suggest three other things. One is, um, and this is much more sociological. Uh, one is societies differ in their narratives. Um, social psychology um, is. is uses the concept of, of narratives. Economics doesn't very much. Um, the work I'm really drawing on here uh, is, is George Akerlof, the great Nobel Prize winner in economics. And um, he uh, emphasizes both narratives and norms. And I think that's really, uh, really important. Um, uh, but to give a couple of examples of of differences between rich and poor societies in narratives. Um, you can see the world as either a zero-sum game or a positive-sum game. You can't see it as both at the same time. But if you believe the world is basically a zero-sum game, the only way I go up is somebody else goes down then uh, is fundamentally not conducive to cooperation. Right? If the world's a zero-sum game, you don't cooperate. That's incidentally the world of academics. Right? Academics is sort of a zero-sum game in reputation, um, which is why academics is so nasty. You know? <laughs> uh, Uwe Kitzinger had this, this wonderful description of, of, of academic disputes. He said, um, academ academic disputes are so vicious because the stakes are so incredibly small. <laughs> which, 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 so it's, it's a zero sum game in reputation. Um, if instead you see the world as a positive sum game, then, you're, then that's much more conducive to saying, well, let's cooperate. And so that's just a difference in, in the narratives that you internalize, whether you see your society as basically being full of opportunities for positive sum games or full of opportunities for zero sum games. Um, uh, another narrative would be the difference between fatalism and aspiration. We know that there's a, a big psychological bias uh, in behavior towards loss aversion. People don't, people want to avoid situations in which they suffer losses. Um, and so if you believe that the probability of loss is quite high, then you'll have a sort of fatalistic attitude on life, and so you won't try. Whereas if you, uh, aspirational, if you believe there's a good chance of success, then, then you'd be much more inclined to take risks, to try. Right? So these are big differences between societies in, in narratives, and they, and they affect uh, behavior. Another example of, of differences is, uh, is in norms. There's a lot of work measuring the norm of trust and huge differences between societies in whether people trust each other. Uh, high trust societies clearly have much lower costs of transactions than low trust societies. And so trust maps into basically the costs of, of doing the business. Uh, 
final difference is is in um, is in organisations. And here I'm going to draw on uh, on another piece of Akerlof work, his little book on identity economics. Um, and the distinction that Akerlof makes is between organisations where the workforce internalizes the objectives of the organization and workforces where the where organizations where the workforce doesn't um, and uh, and that that struck me as really a very powerful distinction because um, my own work on Africa uh, one of the, the most striking features about um, Africa is that that the public services, the basic public services like healthcare and education, um, function surprisingly badly. Um, and they function surprisingly badly because a lot of the workforce has not internalized the basic objectives of the organization. Um, I was just uh, with the, the Ugandan Minister of Finance when we were looking at new survey work on um, on teachers in Uganda and uh, the average contact per day when teachers actually teach is only two hours they're paid for seven and goodness knows what they do with the other five hours right um, then um, a very disturbing thing which Wolfgang you mustn't do in the Central European University is um, as part of this survey, the teachers were tested in the test that they set to the students to see how well they did. Um, and uh, uh, basically, on the, you know, on the maths test, only 4% of the teachers could do well on the maths test that the students said. In other words, the teachers could not possibly have internalized the idea, I'm a good teacher, and my mission is to teach these children how to do these subjects. You know. um, so that's a failure of internalization. Um, and it's clearly, uh, that's clearly not a universal phenomenon, that um, uh, in the high income societies, the most striking th feature of organizations is how good organizations are at getting workforces to internalize even really rather uh, crappy objectives. Um, when I started thinking about this, a memory came, came into my mind of one of my students from a long time ago who was, uh, who was a, a passionate Marxist working class boy from the north of England. And, uh, he was a, you know, I'd taken him as a student at Oxford and uh, when he finished at Oxford, what he really wanted to go and do was go and burn down capitalism. Um, but he couldn't, he couldn't get a job to do that, um, and, uh, and he'd owe money, so he, he got it. Instead, he got a job with a, uh, with, a, with, a, with a very good company, Unilever, but what Unilever was doing was selling soap powder. Um, and so he was put in the marketing team selling soap powder, which was not exactly coincident <laughs> with um, burning down capitalism. Um, anyway, I... I, I I was myself a working class lad from the north of England, and so I, I sort of sympathized with this guy. So a couple of years later, he came to stay with, with me for the weekend. And uh, all he wanted to talk about was, um, was the marketing battle, the weekly marketing battle with Procter & Gamble, and how you would win this battle. And then during the weekend, he said one really revealing phrase. He said, of course, I could never work for those shits in Procter and & Gamble. And basically, the guy had internalized the objectives of winning this marketing battle. And it had taken Unilever only two years to do it. So an effective organization can retread a radical Marxist into a soap powder marketeer in only two years. And an ineffective organization can't get teachers to teach kids, you know? And so there's a big difference between rich countries are 
full of effective organizations. And poor countries aren't. They've got some, but they're really scarce. So let's put all those together. Institutions, yes, they matter. And yes, they reflect the power structure in society. Narratives matter. Norms matter, such as trust. And effective organizations. And I'm going to put them all together and call them the social model of the country. And so, why are poor countries poor and rich countries rich? Because they've got different social models in the end. That's the, that's the turtle at the bottom of the pile. Um, now, if you accept that, you don't have to, but if you do accept that, it's got some really radical implications. Remember that migration is fundamentally being driven by people wanting to move from low income to high income societies. And so in effect, migrants from low-income countries are escaping dysfunctional social models. You might not realize it, but that's in effect what they do. They're moving from dysfunctional social models to societies with more functional social models. Now my, um, my working life has basically been about trying to get um, poor countries to catch up with rich ones. And that seems to me to be the, the vital challenge of the 21st century. Um, the income gap is still horrifically wide, and the struggle in, in your lifetimes, which hopefully will be a successful struggle, I think it will be, will be closing that gap, yeah, catching up. Um, so, where does migration fit in that process of catching up? Well, fundamentally, if my diagnosis of why a poor country is poor is right, the process of catch-up is fundamentally about poor countries changing their social models. That's, the, in the end, the catch-up process. And so, in the end, when we look at migration, we should bear that in mind. We should be thinking, so is it, what's it doing to the gap in social models? Um, there's, we can move people, and people can move. But in the end, it's social models that have got to move, as it were, or social models that have got to spread. Let me turn from the income gap, because that's, that's one big driver of migration. But there are actually going to be three building blocks in migration. So that's one. The second is that the act of migration from a poor country to a rich one is an investment. in the sense that it is costly to do. It's costly to do. You've got an upfront set of costs, and then you've got a stream of returns, which is the higher income you get in the high-income high country. So it's an investment with a return. Um, the investment uh, has to be financed, like all investment. So there's upfront cost of migration, and then a then a payback on it. Now, once we've recognised that that's what's going on, there's an upfront cost of migration. That has a dramatic implication, which says very poor people won't be able to afford it. If migration is an investment which has to be financed, very poor people are out of the picture. Okay? And that's one of the things that we find pretty consistently, that the people who migrate from poor countries are not the poorest people in those countries. 
typically it's the middle income groups or the upper income groups because they're the ones who can finance it. What are the costs? Well, there's the costs of um, not working for a while. There's the cost of the journey, which can be considerable. And there's the cost of, uh, of, of, of what happens when you arrive in the country. Incomes of very poor people in very poor countries are so low that costs which look modest to us in terms of costs of transport and so on are actually enormous relative to their free income, the income over and above the income they need just to stay alive. So poor people just are out of it. So migration is not for the poor. Um, it's for the, as I say, the middle and upper income groups in poor countries. So that's our second feature. And now we come to the, the third feature, which is um, to, to say that those costs of migration, the investment costs, themselves depend upon, upon something which turns out to be the most important driver of migration. And that is the diaspora in the country of arrival. By the diaspora, I mean the, the previous migrants from the same country who've retained their links with the country of origin. Now, why does the diaspora matter? It matters because it lowers the costs for subsequent migrants. How does it do that? Well, several ways. One is, it's the flow of information. Quite often, it's actually a flow of biased information. Um, you're a migrant from a poor country that's working in a rich country. What do you tell mum? Right. You're inclined, for the obvious psychological reasons, to reassure mum you are actually doing pretty well, yeah. even if you're not. And so the flow of, my, the flow of information is, is, is not only lowers the costs, it is actually biased. There's also a flow of financing. Who is best placed to finance the cost of the journey? Um, the people who have already arrived are earning much bigger incomes. Not only are they in a better position to pay that money, they're in a better position to recover that money. So if you want to lend, you know, if the proposition is, yeah, this is a good investment, you know, so the, my, the potential migrant says, look, it's worth funding the costs because the returns are sufficiently high that I could pay it back. And the, the rich uncle back in the country of origin thinks about that and thinks, yeah, but will he send the money back? Right? Um, but the rich cousin in the country of arrival knows, oh yeah, I'll be able to get it out of him because I'll be putting him up. And that's the final reason why diasporas lower the cost, because um, diasporas provide a welcome to subsequent immigrants. They provide somewhere where they can stay, and they provide a network of employment opportunities. So if we look at the, econometric, the recent econometric work explaining migration, uh, the single most powerful influence um, is not even the income gap, it's the, the size of the diaspora. But the two work together. A big income gap and a small diaspora doesn't produce a lot of migration because the costs of migration are too high. A big diaspora but a small income gap doesn't produce much migration 
why move? It's an interaction, so it's a multiplicative effect. It's an e a big income gap with a big diaspora. That's what produces big migration. So we've got an income gap interacting with a diaspora. What produces the diaspora? Migration. So we've got migration depending on the diaspora and the diaspora depending on migration right? and interdependency. Um, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Right? Um, well, in this case, uh, we can actually sort out which is the chicken and which is the egg because if we go back to say 1950 diasporas from poor countries living in rich countries were very small because for a variety of reasons borders have been closed for many years basically between 1914 and about 1950 borders were closed for a variety of reasons. So we start the modern process of migration from poor countries to rich ones in about 1950 with very small diasporas right? and a wide income gap. So a wide income gap of very small diasporas would produce pretty moderate levels of migration, not very big migration. Right? And that migration then increases the size of the diaspora. In fact, if we look at 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, in that period, the income gap is widening because most poor countries are stagnating, and these are the golden years of economic growth for the rich countries. Right? So the income gap is getting wider and wider, and the diaspora is starting to build, but, but from very small initial levels, and so the build-up is quite slow. From about 1980, poor countries start to accelerate their growth. First, East Asia in the 1980s, then South Asia in the 1990s, and then Latin America and Africa in the last decade. So last, we're starting to get uh, the, the poor countries growing more rapidly than the rich countries. In one sense, they're catching up. But by then, the income gap is so wide that even though the poor countries grow more rapidly than the rich ones, the absolute gap in income still gets wider. Um, that's even true for the moment, I think. I mean, let, let's take China, which at the moment is growing about 7%, and its, and its income level is about $6,000, so it's no longer a poor country. Um, so 7% growth on an income of $6,000, your income is going up by about $400 a year. Yeah. America, what should we say, $30,000 growth of 2% a year. So China growing at 7%, America at 2 What's happening to the absolute gap in income? China's income going up at $400, 7% of 6000 America, 2% of 30000 going up at $600. So in absolute terms, the income gap between China and America is still getting wider. Income gap between... Africa and the, uh, and, and, and the rich world is getting wider even though Africa is now growing much faster than the rich world. So growth rates 
don't translate until narrow, into narrowing of income gaps for a long time. Eventually, compound growth rates work their magic. But it takes a long time. China's just getting to that point. Where over the next 10 years, the, the absolute income gap will be closed. Why does the absolute income gap matter? Well, think back to that investment model. You're spending you know, maybe a couple of thousand dollars to get from a low-income country to a rich one. So there's an absolute investment, and there's an absolute return on it, which is the income stream in the rich world minus a much lower income stream in the poor world. So the return on migration can be going up even though the poor country is growing much faster than the rich one. So that's one reason why even after 1980, when the poor world started to catch up, the income gap incentive for migration was increasing the incentive to migrate. Not only was the income gap increasing the incentive to migrate, but as income levels rose in poor countries, think what that does to migration, given what I've told you about it. Can anybody, anybody want to relieve me of the effort of thinking for a moment since I've just got off a plane from China? Um, as income levels rise in poor countries, what does that do to emigration from them? Not the obvious answer, right? The obvious answer would be my emigration slows down. Why is that wrong? Very good, very good, okay. Because people can better afford to, to make the investment in the cost of migration. Right? So, the absolute income gap is widening, bigger incentive to move. The ability to finance migration is going up, more money. And finally, remember the most powerful influence on migration is the diaspora. And the diaspora is getting bigger. Yeah. And so all three of the effects in the post-1980, you'd expect migration to accelerate. And it does. Every decade it accelerates. Um, so is there an equilibrium to all this? Does migration just continue to accelerate forever? Um, and for that, we're going to uh, we're going to put our building blocks together. Um, okay, I need to do one little one one further building block, which is that migration adds to the diaspora, very obviously, right? What is the diaspora? It's the accumulated stock of migrants who are still in touch with their host society. Um, so we've got to flow into the diaspora, which is migration. There's also a flow out of the diaspora. And the flow out of the diaspora is basically absorption into the host society. My grandfather was an immigrant from a dirt poor village to the richest city in Europe. So it was a dirt poor village in Germany, and he went to Bradford, which at the time was the richest city in Europe. Um, and uh, and my, my father, my father's generation sort of kept in touch a bit with the, with the village. And I, my father changed his name, which is why I'm called Collier and not Helen Schritt. Um, and I've completely lost touch. I am not part of the German diaspora in Britain in the sense that I'm totally useless for anybody from Ernsbach who wanted to come to Bradford. Right? 
So that is absorption out of the diaspora into the host society. So one, one concept of equilibrium is when does migration stop accelerating? And the simplest answer to that is when the diaspora stops growing. And the diaspora stops growing when the flow in to the diaspora from migration equals the flow out from the diaspora into the mainstream of the society. Right? People like me. Right? Um, so our final building block is what determines that rate of flow out. Um, and the, there are many things that determine the rate of flow out, uh, but the simplest one is just the size of the diaspora. When my grandfather arrived in Bradford, um, his sense of youthful adventure had got him out of this village as far as Bradford. Right? At that time, incidentally, if you got any money at all, you didn't go to Bradford, you went to America. Right? Um, but if you, so if you've got enough money, you've got across the Atlantic. If you've no money at all, you've got across the channel. Right? So he got across the channel. Right? Um, but what happened when he got to Bradford was um, youth, the youthful adventure reached its limits, and he went straight in Bradford to a little district of Bradford where there were so many Germans that the district was called Little Germany. Um, and so my grandfather, he lived to be a very old man, um, he never lost his German accent um, because he, grew, he, he was living surrounded by other Germans, basically. Um, there's a there's a famous anthropological number called the Dunbar constant, um, which is that anthropologists have worked out that basically across the world, um, the number of people that you can actually genuinely interact with is, is a constant at about 150. Right? So, you know, you can count, I've got 832 friends on Facebook or whatever, but the actual serious interaction with people is about 150. Um, and so the bigger the diaspora, um, the higher the proportion of interactions that are with other members of the diaspora uh, rather than with the indigenous host population. And so other things equal, the less rapidly you're going to be absorbed into the mainstream society. So we're now going to put those three building blocks together. We've got um, migration um, being a function of the diaspora. Uh, the diaspora being a function of migration and the um, absorption of the diaspora, the rate of absorption of the diaspora being a function of the size of the diaspora. And if you're an intuitive genius, you can see where the equilibrium is in that without the need for a model. <laughs> but otherwise, a model helps. So here's a model. Very simple, and I can show it in a picture, which economists like to call diagrams. And we'll put the rate of migration up here. So that's the rate of migration. High rate of migration, no migration. Um, and we'll put the size of the diaspora along here. No diaspora, big diaspora. Um, and first we'll look at um, migration as a function of the size of the diaspora. So there's an income gap, and just, just for convenience, we'll keep the income gap wide and constant. Right? So the income gap is, is just there 
in this model. We could bring it in, but we need another dimension. Right? So if there's no diaspora, we still get some migration that much. And then as the diaspora gets bigger, we get more migration. So that's migration as a function of the diaspora. Huh? Easy. Huh? Now we're going to introduce a, a slightly more subtle con concept. Um, I'll stop dancing about. Um, the, um, so the, the next concept, to understand this, this is called a migration function. Right? It just means migration gets bigger as the diaspora gets bigger because the diaspora helps migrants. Right? That's easy. Uh, the next thing uh, is a little bit more subtle. We're going to look for all the, all the positions in this space uh, where the diaspora stays constant. And the diaspora stays constant because the flow into it from migration equals the flow out of it into absorption into, into the host society. Right? So one point where the diaspora stays constant is obviously if the diaspora is zero. Right? Um, more generally, we're going to get a function that looks something like that. So that's d dot just means the rate of change of the diaspora. And we're looking for the rate of change equals zero. Um, how does this work? Well, all positions to the left of that schedule say a position like here, we've got a lot of migration and only a very small diaspora. Right? That much migration and this much diaspora. So there's a big flow in. And because it's a very small diaspora, not much of a rate of absorption out of it, and not, not much absorption out of it. And so, position like that, the diaspora is getting bigger. Conversely, if we went right over here, we've got the same amount of migration, but now we've got a huge diaspora, and the, the diaspora is leaking people. And it's leaking people faster than the rate of flow in. And so the diaspora is shrinking. And this, whether the flow in and the flow out are the same, that's, that's, the, that's the position. Why does it have this curve? This is the only bit where you actually need to really sort of put your thinking cap on. Um, the curve, the curvature just shows the rate of absorption of the diaspora into the host society. And the bigger the diaspora, the more people in the diaspora interact with other people in the diaspora relative to people outside the diaspora, the slower the rate of absorption. That's why it's a curvature. So one advantage of a model is you can then straight away see, ah, Here's the equilibrium. So if the society starts with no diaspora, but an income gap, then it basically starts here. It's always going to be on the migration function. And then the society will gradually march up that migration function, so it march along that migration function up to this point, and then the migration rate will just stay at that rate. So that's an equilibrium rate of migration. Now, I've drawn it like this. I could have drawn it a little differently. Fortuitously, we've got multicolored pens, so let's take advantage of them. <laughs> 
And um, suppose that um, we could do it either with a, let's do it with a bigger income gap. It would increase the income gap. And so even if there's no diaspora, because the income gap's bigger, we get more migration. Let's suppose with no, no diaspora, we get that much migration. Here we go. So here's our migration function, the function of the diaspora. The rate of change, the, the, the locus of where the diaspora stays constant isn't altered. So what now happens? Well, there isn't an equilibrium. Still, march up that migration function. But we never, we never cross the diaspora schedule. We just keep going. So migration explodes. So with narrow income gaps, we get to an equilibrium rate of migration. With sufficiently wide income gaps, we just get accelerating migration. No equilibrium. The, um, that's a rather dramatic prediction. It says with big, big enough income gaps, migration will just accelerate. Is there any evidence? Um, well, there's some survey evidence. Economists don't like opinion surveys because we don't really trust that people will do what they say. You know? Um, so let's treat this evidence with a hefty dose of skepticism. But people have actually asked people in poor countries, um, would you like to migrate to a rich country if you could afford it and there were no immigration restrictions on it? And 40% uh, of the population says yes, which is quite a lot. As I say, economists... Basically, we don't set much store by that because people say all sorts of things and we prefer the concept of reveal preference. We prefer to see what people do. Um, so let's have a look at what people do. Well, here's a problem. We can't because people generally don't have unconstrained choices about migration. Because high-income countries all impose immigration controls. So I tried to find a case where there weren't immigration controls. Um, and the only one I could find, there may be others, but the one I could find um, was a Turkish Cyprus. I don't know if there are any Turkish Cypriots in the audience, any? Um, I'll tell you why there aren't any Turkish Cypriots in the audience in a moment. <laughs> um, so, um, in uh, the data on migration is terrible. Right? And for Turkish Cypriots, it's no exception. Right? Um, so let's do our best. Um, I try to find out what the population of... The, the, I should say that the reason why Turkish Cypriots were an ano anomaly is that Cyprus was part of the Commonwealth and Commonwealth citizens had entitlement to go and live in, uh, in Britain. Um, and Turkish Cyprus was important because it was much lower income than Greek Cyprus. Um, it wasn't desperately poor. So Turkish Cyprus was, was kind of exactly in the range where you'd predict, according to this model, a lot of out-migration. 
It was poor enough that there was a big income gap, but not so poor that people couldn't finance migration. And the costs of migration were not that high because, because Cyprus is not that far from Britain. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a, a sort of an anomalous situation in which the model says income gap wide enough, level of income high enough that we would predict accelerating migration. Um, and it might be this case, it might just keep going. Um, So I looked to see what was the population of, the, of Turkish Cypriots in Britain um, as of about 1945. Uh, and it was about 2,000, as far as we could see. Um, though the data from that period is not very good, but it's a, it was about 2,000 Turkish Cypriots living in Britain. Um, the, the, the population now of Turkish Cypriots in Britain according to the, the British Home Office, uh, is 300,000. Um, so what's the population of Turkish Cypriots in Cyprus? Um, 80,000. Um, so, um, so there are far more Turkish Cypriots in Britain than there are in Turkish Cyprus. Um, Turkish Cyprus did not empty. Uh, Turkish Cypriots are now a minority in Turkish Cyprus. Um, because as they left, Turks were even poorer than Turkish Cypriots, and so Turks came in. So Turkish Cypriots are now a minority in northern Cyprus. It's mainly Turks, uh, and the Turkish Cypriots have gone to, gone to Britain. So that is, um, as it were, some evidence to suggest, yeah, this, this, this really is right, you know, that... that uh, um, you really do get an exodus if there are no controls. Um, finally, let's turn to the question of evaluation. And uh, what should we, how should we evaluate migration? You know, if this is the sort of process. Um, and it, it, let me put my own perspective here. My own perspective is that the overarching priority uh, is for the poorest societies to catch up. Um, the potentially we could we could say, well, the poor the poor societies just just do a Turkish Cyprus. That is, they empty. Um, everybody comes and lives in rich countries. Uh, that's clearly um, politically not going to happen. Um, but even if it did, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't myself regard it as a as a success. That, um, poor. It seems to me the priority is that the poor societies themselves need to succeed. Um, rather than poor people abandon those societies. And of course, in practice, um, most people in poor societies are going to stay in poor societies. Um, and so it's all the more imperative that the people who stay actually, if, if, if the majority of people are going to stay in poor societies, it's important that those societies catch up. And so it seems to me one major building block in evaluating the effects of migration from poor to rich is what it does for, um, for, the, for the poor societies themselves. Now, if we go back to where I started those social models, that means that the fundamental question is how does that out-migration affect pace of change of social models in the poorest countries. And, there is, and there's no easy answer. I want to, rather than squash it into two minutes of this lecture, I'm going to give you a whole lecture on that next lecture. But it's basically going to pose the question, what does migration do 
for the poorest countries, for the people left behind in poor countries. So that's one, to my mind, very important way of evaluating, criterion for evaluating migration. Um, another criterion, also seems to me legitimate, is what does it do to the host societies? Remember the host societies are high income because they've got functional social models. So this is a reasonable question, what does it do to the social models in rich countries? And then finally, there's a question, what does it do for the migrants? So to my mind, we've got to look at all three of those things and then in some way weight them and say, well, there's, there's one effect on the, the people left behind in poor societies, there's one effect on the indigenous populations of host societies, and there's one effect on the migrants. And we have to balance those three effects. That's not what economics typically does. Um, what economics typically does um, is treat, um, is analyze migration in exactly the same models that it uses to analyze trade. Um, so we've got these general equilibrium computable models of trade um, where we say if we, if we liberalize trade, what happens to global welfare? And the computable model adds up about a million little triangles and comes up with an answer. Um, and that's the, those are the numbers which are then used, sort of used, in global trade negotiations at the World Trade Organization. Actually, nobody in their right mind believes those numbers, um, but the World Bank dutifully calculates them and reports them. I used to be in charge of the process of generating these, these things. Well, I, I directed the research department of the World Bank. Um, the, uh, so you can use exactly the same model and say if we move some people from poor societies to rich ones, um, what happens? And then you get very clear answers out of the computable general equilibrium model. Um, because people produce more in rich countries than they do in poor countries. So the more people you move, uh, the, the more the global income goes up. Um, and, uh, and then economics has this, this glorious concept of, uh, of Pareto efficiency, which is basically, um, it's, 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 it's saying, as long as, as long as there's a global gain, um, so that the, the people who gain could compensate the people who lose, um, then that's good enough. Um, it isn't good enough. Um, because there's no mechanism by which the people who gain do compensate the people who lose. And so, to my mind, it's important to actually decompose and say, here are these three effects. The effects on the, the people left behind, the effects on the host country, and the effects on the migrants. And we have to look at all three in turn. We can't just rely on these computable models to come up with a global utilitarian answer and say that's the that's the answer. But that's what economics does. So on that note, I'll stop. But we've got, I think, 15 minutes for questions. So over to you. Thank you very much for this fascinating lecture. It feels almost personal. I'm an immigrant myself, so I can almost attach faces and names on the diaspora and on the stories. Um, and I think it resonates with a lot of people in a community in which there is no majority culture here at CEU. Mm -hmm. uh, I will abuse my moderator position here to ask the first question. <laughs> what do you think is the role of economic crisis in the developed countries for migration in general? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the question was, was what is the role of economic crisis in the developed countries? 
in migration. And um, uh, it's, uh, so let me pan back to, to the, the sort of recent economic history of the rich world, which was a mega boom followed by a mega bust. Right? So we had a, a boom to end all booms from about the year 2000 up to 2007. And the distinctive feature of that boom was that it ran for much longer than most previous booms. Um, and the reason that the boom didn't really trigger inflation. And by that period, all the major central banks uh, were doing inflation targeting. So that the, the, the indicator they were looking for before they were willing to rein in the boom was inflation. Now you've got massive increases in asset prices, especially house prices, so huge construction booms. Things that really look like asset bubbles, but all the central banks, the, the mantra was, um, oh, that's nothing to do with us. You can't tell, a, and never mind asset prices, they're off the map, we're just looking at the rate of price and consumer price inflation, and that's staying low. Yeah? And so that's why the booms ran much longer and the, as a consequence, the actual structural imbalances in society, in economies, built up to much bigger proportions. And so the booms were allowed to run, in my view, for much too long. So the, the, the disequilibrium in uh, housing markets, for example, became enormous. Uh, and that's why you then get these desperately deep recessions. So that's the, the, the sort of typical story in, in the CD. Um, now, what, how does migration play into that? Um, well, one reason why the booms didn't trigger inflation was that they were sustained by a lot of immigration. So you've got um, the booms being sustained by big increase in the immigrant labor force. And then you get the mega bust, very heavy unemployment. And then the adjustment, the labor market adjustment varies a lot, um, basically depending upon where the migrants had come from. If the income gap hadn't, wasn't that wide, then when you, when the, the society crashes, a lot of the migrants go back home. So that's the story of Ireland. Ireland had this completely disastrous boom bust, um, absolutely crazy, um, with the boom being fueled by massive amount of immigration including my friends, um, and then they left, including my friends. <laughs> um, uh, but that was because they came typically from Poland or Portugal or somewhere like that, where the, the income gap wasn't that big. Um, if the income gap's very big, then the immigrants come during the boom, but don't go during the slump, um, because it's better to hang on. Uh, especially if you don't have solid rights of, of being able to get back in. Um, so, so that's how it's sort of played out to date. So I, I think the, um, um, it, was, it was greatly compounded, in my view, by the central banking errors of, of the, 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 all the central banks happening at the time to be doing inflation targeting which they've now largely given up because they realize what a mistake it was. Thank you very much. Let's take some questions. In the back, please. Yeah, um, <coughs> 
So I don't know. Is it working? No, I'm not. Just yeah. It's live. It's live stream. So. Ah. <laughs> Great. Um, I don't know if I agree with attributing primal causality to uh, social norms, because to use your metaphor, uh, I'm sure there must be some turtles that are actually influencing social norms as well. Um, but my question was, I don't know if you think if um, growing environmental inequality might be a future driver of migration. Yeah, so the question is whether growing environmental inequality uh, will be a cause of future migration. Um, and there's certainly that's a concern, is that um, if we don't address climate change, then um, some parts of the Earth uh, may become um, basically uninhabitable. Um, and if so, that will certainly trigger out migration. Now, where those people go is then a, a, you know, an open question. My, my guess is that most of the migration it would trigger would be between poor countries. Uh, rather than poor to rich. Um, it would be the migration of desperation. And the migration of desperation basically shuffles people over land borders um, rather than the big leaps. Um, so, and, th and that can then be very destabilizing for poor societies. Um, but that would be my first guess, is the climate change if allowed to, to, to rip, would produce quite big population movements between poor countries, which would then be um, socially pretty destabilizing. Um, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify how exactly you envision the um, creation of better social models or the improvement of social models in poor countries. Um, do, do you see it as uh, simply the social models being re-imported re from countries that had been emigrated to, or would these be more sort of organic, locally grown social models? Yeah, that's a good question, and I didn't get a chance to, to talk about this. It's, it's, I should say there is no one good social model. Yeah. Um, and if you look around the, the high-income world, um, First of all, the social models are very different one country to another. You know, Japan looks nothing like uh, the typical European country, and the typical European country looks nothing like America. Um, but they're all high income. Um, uh, but I probably overstate it when I say nothing like. But the, what happens is that the, somehow the combination of institutions, narratives, norms, and organizations um, fits together, coheres. The package works, even if the individual components differ society by society. Um, it's clearly an organic process within a society. So the attempts to transplant have invariably been disastrous. Um, so these are fundamentally organic evolutions in which societies struggle to change their institutions and if, if the fundamental diagnosis of where do the institutions come from, they come from the power structures is right, then that's basically struggles over power. Where does power lie? Um, the evolution of narratives, um, at any one time, there are competing narratives trying to, to take hold in societies. You know, think of Pakistan, or Egypt now, competing narratives. Um, and there's not much that external actors can do there. I mean, these are the, 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 these are the, the struggles <coughs> um, 
similarly with norms. So norms evolve, um, albeit slowly. Um, think how they involve, have evolved in enriched societies. There's, there's a very good, very good book on the uh, evolution of norms of violence by the social psychologist Stephen Pinker um, called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which came out a couple of years ago. And that is a, a global history of the norm of violence. And what he shows is that um, the rich world over the last 200 years has become massively less violent than it used to be and massively less violent than other societies. So it's a complete historical anomaly and he traces how that came about. Um, or if we think just within my lifetime, um, 50 years ago, um, if somebody in this room had taken out a cigarette, that would have been fine. But if somebody had said, I'm gay, we'd all have reacted in horror. Right? And now it's the other way around. Right? Um, and, um, and, and that was a very, a very gradual process over 50 years of sort of salami slicing changes in social norms. Um, so norms do change, but they're, but, but, they're, but they're internal to societies. You know, if, 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 um, uh, if Martians had come and told us, you know, you've got to be nice to gay people and stop smoking, uh, we'd, have, we'd have told the Martians, go to hell. Right? Um, quite rightly. Right? And, and, um, so you can't, you can't do this from outside, obviously. Um, you probably can do something with efficient, effective organizations, the, the internalization process. That it's, it's actually very hard to build effective organizations. And they're the things that you probably can actually transfer. That an effective organization can actually function internationally, can take its it, it, it's a process of internalizing norms and do that in a lot of different countries. So that's the bit that's probably uh, most transferable. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you for your speech. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. So, uh, um, yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, I don't expect a straightforward question uh, response, actually. Um, should there be a right to migrate? What kind of right should that be? And can we even establish it uh, econom in, in economic terms? It's a normative question. Yeah. So. No, it's the right, it's the right question. Um, and you're quite right. I'm not going to answer it now. That's not because I want to duck the question. Uh, I want to build up the building blocks. Um, and at the end of the three lectures, you will answer that question yourself. Okay? Um, because uh, I am not going to tell you what to think, but I am going to try and tell you how to think. Okay? I'm going to try and give you building blocks with which you can then think through positions. And you won't all arrive at the same answers, but I, my hope is that you'll see, ah, these are the building blocks I need to use in order to arrive at an answer. And you get, two of you will get to different answers because you will disagree not about values, I'm a good person, you're a bad person, but you'll disagree about some empirical aspect of how you actually sort of calibrate the building blocks I'm giving you. Um, I think the migration debate has been disastrous because it has become a debate about values rather than a debate about facts. Um, it's been um, politicized before it's been analyzed. And that's why it's so emotional <laughs> 
because it's people shouting at each other with different values. And that is that takes us absolutely nowhere. It's like sheep bleating at each other. Right? Um, so my my effort, my 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 hope is that I can give you the building blocks with which to think. Um, I'll end with the, the most encouraging thing that, uh, that has been said to me um, about, uh, from people who've actually read Exodus. Um, there's a guy who came up a couple of weeks ago and said, I, I want to thank you for writing Exodus. So because migration was the one subject where my sister and I could not talk about because we disagreed. And now, we can talk about it. Because you've, you've reduced the issues into, into domain where we don't just hurl insults at each other. We discuss things that are actually practical. So. Thank you.